get started. So I'm really excited today to introduce today's uh, informatics seminar talk speaker, uh, Laurie Velix. It's a good friend and we know each other, I don't know, over 10 years already. Lauren is currently a research lead in the Google Wellbeing Lab, and she's also an associate professor at Georgia Tech. Um, she has done a um, lot of fabulous work, and from her early work of patient in patient engagement and co design work in the emergency inpatient unit, to her recent work on healthcare, aligning healthcare patient, clinicians, and caregivers' needs with the AI system and AI design. Um, so I'm just really excited to, um, to have Lauren here. And I know many of the students who are interested in healthcare are also here. Um, just um, great to have this opportunity to, to learn from Lauren about her some of her recent work uh, at Google about healthcare and AI. Uh, I also wanted to mention that Lauren has um, won many awards in the past and her work has been supported by the NSF Career Award. She has been funded by HRQ, uh, part of the NIH funding agency. She is also a member of ACM Future of Computing Academy and she served on many um, HCI and medical informatics conference committees. Um, so we're I'm very excited to learn your recent work and what you have to say about AI and healthcare. Awesome, thank you so much, Judith. Um, so I hope I won't disappoint you too much. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk, actually, I wanna highlight some of um, the work that, I, that I've been doing with Matt Hong. Um, so I'll be you know, probably focusing a little bit more on that, but I, I wanna start off um, with a general intro and definitely we'll be touching on things we're doing at Google and happy to talk more about those too. So yes, absolutely. Um, so thank you for, for attending today. I wanna first provide some background, kind of motivating the rest of the talk. <clears throat> so in the past 10 to 15 years, there's been really a confluence of advancements in computing infrastructure and mobile and wearable devices and policy and in the collection and sharing of really rich data sets um, and these increase the urgency to do computing research in digital health and healthcare. So it's no wonder that we're seeing AI being applied to meet challenges in healthcare. And you know, these examples include deep neural network-based machine learning approaches to classification and detection of several types of cancer, uh, as well as diabetic retinopathy screening, <clears throat> uh, which I'll actually talk about more in a minute. And you know, so what I mean by AI here is really a constellation of technologies that allow a system to, to display any kind of intelligent behavior. Um, though much of what we call you know, AI today refers to um, deep learning. So while we see a lot of potential for AI to be helpful, we also see challenges, um, and this probably won't be news to those of you <laughs> attending the talk, we see challenges going from kind of R&D environments to the real world. This last mile ends up being really hard. And so, um, you know, for example, in the worst case, we find that system performance, once deployed, um, doesn't necessarily improve overall accuracy um, in medical decision-making, um, as well as many other challenges, right? Some of them listed here. So what's going on? <laughs> um, what, you know, what can we do, right? In part, right, one of, the, one of the things that I think is really important is that in health context, we have to look not just at the performance of one technology, right? We're, we have to think about the socio-technical system and to consider, I, again, I know for many of you, this, this is um, you know, already integrated even into your research, but uh, for those of you who might be new to this, as we consider a system to be socio-technical, um, you know, in, in that the way uh, a system functions as a whole emerges from uh, what can be a fairly complex interplay of its envisioned design, its envisioned purpose, and its actual use. And so we know technology shapes workflows, it mediates human communication, it can disrupt social norms, uh, it can disrupt contexts of care. And these norms, these care contexts, in turn, impact how people use technology, whether they adopt it or not, how they appropriate it. And so this is really what my, my research focuses on. And I'll walk through a case 
um, that highlights how important this is. So our extended team at Google developed a machine learning based model to detect diabetic retinopathy and macular edema on standard fundus photographs. So these are photos of the retina, which is that thin layer at the back of the eye that senses light and sends signals to the brain. And the model makes an assessment of whether or not the patient needs to be referred to a specialist. So two retrospective evaluations showed that the model performs very well, essentially on par with a retinal specialist. Well, the Thailand Ministry of Health was interested in partnering with us to address a shortage of specialists in Thailand and improve eye screening throughput. So we deployed our deep learning system and a prospective study to evaluate system accuracy. And hopefully, you know, in doing so also improve screening processes along the way. <clears throat> and alongside this prospective study evaluating system accuracy, we conducted a human-centered study that involved field research at 11 clinics across Thailand over a period of eight months. And so I um, want to quickly shout out Emma Beattie and Elizabeth Baylor here, um, who were uh, some of the researchers who did a lot of the on the ground work and really led the charge in Thailand. Um, and we studied workflow before and after deployment of the deep learning system. So our data included interviews, observations, and we did some log analyses of usage data of the system. And, you know, we know that for our model to be successful, it not only needs to be accurate, right, but it needs to meet real people's needs. And in this case, we had to make sure that this is going to work for nurses. So we were very focused on nurses um, who would be using it every day, right, uh, and, and the patients that it would service. So I want to give also an overview of the general eye screening process uh, that takes place at some of the clinics that Emma and Elizabeth visited. Um, we observed some differences across clinics, but in general, there was a consistent workflow. Over a hundred patients generally queue up for screening in the morning to receive a full diabetic checkup. So this is you know, checking their blood sugar, their feet, their teeth, their eyes, and uh, they need to, to sit right uh, with a number and wait to be seen, wait for this number to be called because there aren't any appointments, right? So um, even, even processes like what's the typical protocol for a patient to be seen by a physician can be very different, right? Um, uh, in different contexts. And the whole experience can really take up to five hours, right? For each patient, the eye screening portion is only allotted about 90 seconds to take the image and do a quick assessment to decide if the image needs to be sent to an ophthalmologist for review. Um, if it takes longer, this can cause delays and, and long waits. So, you know, what happened when we introduced AI into this process? Well, one of the first things we learned had to do with something called gradeability. So gradeability refers to the ability to read an image and make an assessment. And when clinicians are conducting screenings, they have guidelines basically that they're using to determine if the photograph of the retina is clear enough, uh, and if to make an assessment in the first place, and if so, what is that assessment uh, about possibility of diabetic retinopathy? And, and these guidelines and their interpretation can really vary between clinicians. Well, you know, the deep learning model needed to set a threshold for features around image quality, like blur and darkness, uh, before it could make an assessment about diabetic retinopathy based on that image. And so if an image is extremely blurry, just like a clinician, the model might actually just reject it and essentially deem it ungradable. Well, after deployment of the deep learning system, we observed from system logs that on average, about 20% of the images couldn't be read by the model. There were gradability problems. And so during our fieldwork, we observed reasons for this, including different conditions in the environment of use. Um, and you know, these conditions were really important and affected, again, system performance as a whole um, and weren't necessarily apparent in the development environment. And so, you know, so we have these gradability issues and we also observed that study protocol problems made some of the patient workflow burdensome for those patients who were referred to specialists. So we were very focused on model development and kind of the lab setting 
Uh, and we learned that researching how protocols might best fit the workflow was actually really, really important, just as important as getting the model right. So together, some of these shortcomings ended up impacting trust in the system and willingness uh, for the nurses to refer patients to participate in the prospective study and, and use the system. So, you know, in summary here, again, this is yet another um, example of the case that, you know, I think an important case showing that that accuracy is not enough. And, and we might suspect this, right, based on our research, but you know, we really found this when we when we went out and, and deployed the system. We went in confident about our model, but, you know, issues can inhibit trust and have downstream effects for patients that have to do with the environment and really better understanding workflow and what some of those conditions surrounding use are. So second, you know, much of the success of the system adoption, ability to drive outcomes uh, may continue to be influenced by protocols around use of the technology as we saw in our prospective study. And what I don't see personally in the literature as much is what are protocols of use? Um, and how do we think about um, ways of developing these protocols systematically. And finally, you know, we see this as an important example of how human AI centered design, human centered design, right, um, can kind of fit into this AI development process because we can see the importance of conducting human centered evaluations before, during, and after deployment of a system to inform further development. Um, so by, by understanding workflow before we introduce it, we can understand how that workflow was altered and uh, where some of these trust issues may originate. And also just potential obstacles, right? Obstacles and opportunities. You know, one thing we didn't necessarily expect, uh, but, but definitely found to be the case once we were in the field is that, you know, nurses not only use the technology for, um, for their own screening process, but also to help explain to patients, right? Uh, what their screening result was and why it was so important to follow up with a specialist. And so, you know, these are uses that machine learning researchers didn't necessarily anticipate, like this might be used as a teaching tool, right? Um, so uh, really better understanding that context and why it might be important for the nurse to sort of like turn the screen around and say, no, look, there's really, you know, there's a lot of evidence here that is suggestive that it's really important for you to see a specialist. Um, you know, these are actually really important signals that can influence system design so that we can make that experience much better for the patient. Um, and, uh, and think about things like explainability much farther upstream. Okay, so we published findings from that study in April of last year, and we were encouraged to see that in the fall, Nature Medicine, the British Medical Journal, and the Lancet all announced new standards for how clinical trials should be conducted and reported. So the spirit statement is one set um, and this is important for, I think, everyone attending who, who has interest in AI and, and, um, and health. The spirit statement um, specifies that we have to describe things like the setting in which the AI is evaluated and details about how humans interact with the AI system. So there is no, th this is now you know, a, a standard that uh, research teams will have to meet when running clinical trials with a, uh, a component that involves AI. The other set of guidelines comes from CONSORT. So CONSORT provides the kind of minimum reporting guidelines for randomized trials. Their new reporting guidelines for clinical trials that have an AI component include the need to report on the settings in which the AI will be integrated um, and human AI interaction. So this is a big deal because these statements you know, set the standard for clinical trials used around the world for drug development, diagnostic tests, medical interventions. And unfortunately, our study wasn't exactly common practice. Uh, it's it, one of the only studies people cite when talking about how to achieve these new guidelines. So we need more studies, <laughs> uh, more exemplars, right? And, uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to set the course of what a good human AI interaction study in this space looks like. So notice that the study I just walked through really looked at the later stages of model building and system development and kind of focused more on deployment of the system. And one reason that the study got attention is because too often HCI or human-centered computing informatics um, focused on human-centered computing 
gets called in, you know, our expertise gets called in, you know, at, at kind of late, later stages of development. And one way to get ahead of problems is to conduct this kind of research, right? Broadly, I'll, I'll coin it HCI. We can talk about that definition, but um, let's use HCI as the, as the overarching term. One way to get ahead of problems is to conduct this HCI research that incorporates human and socio-technical perspectives throughout each stage of creating machine learning or AI-based systems. So I've abstracted the stages here and I'll kind of refer to this as a pipeline. And I'll talk about studies that use human-centered design and research at different stages of this pipeline to illustrate how to do this. Um, so since I already talked about some recent work from Google, I'm gonna focus next on some work that, um, uh, uh, that I focused on in my lab and that Matt Hong was very involved in. So through a five-year partnership with CHOA, we conducted studies spanning multiple clinics and we were motivated to partner together around patient engagement goals, specifically the prevalence of chronic conditions among adolescents is growing and in some cases like cancer um, you know, uh, and blood disorders, outcomes are actually worse for teenage adolescents than for older patients or younger patients with the same conditions. So engagement and communication are really difficult. Um, and Cho was interested in how computing technology could be better designed to meet the needs of this group. So we had the privilege of working with almost 120 patient and family participants in our studies and 34 clinical caregivers. And to begin, you know, we really dove into field work, uh, looking at how patients and family members and clinicians work together to manage the patient's health. Um, we did about 38 interviews in this first phase, observing 14 oncology encounters all in situ. And we focused primarily on the, the clinical setting, but we also asked families questions about managing conditions day to day. Here we wanted our field work to inform the earlier phases of the pipeline we talked about, right? Basically like problem selection. And then, you know, what other data sets do we need to collect, right? After we've done this, you know, foundational kind of formative, um, we kicked off this formative work, then what do we need to do rather than um, kind of leading with the data set first? Like, oh, we have access to this, let's just use it. <clears throat> and so um, this kind of helped us to keep our assumptions in check here. <clears throat> so we collected rich qualitative data. This is just a sample of it. So my colleagues were not happy with me when I like took up all these things and started encroaching upon um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> ambiguous territories. Uh, no, that, that's not true. They were very, everyone's very supportive, but yes, we collected rich qualitative data uh, and, and here we took an inductive approach to qualitative data analysis, uh, which means we went kind of bottom up from raw transcribed segments of the interviews and observation notes to really progressively higher level units of meaning. And so when we do coding here in this work, it's a process of identifying passages in, in the text or other items and, and identifying <clears throat> concepts and finding relationships between them um, in what would probably be described as a reflexive thematic analysis process where we're kind of keeping up engagement as the data is coming in uh, and revisiting that data with respect to other data, et cetera. And then when we say in vivo, you know, we mean here just embodying the participant's point of view. So to complement our qualitative data analysis, we conducted a mixed method study, investigating families' experiences accessing the teen's online personal health record. Um, this is often called a portal. And so if you're like me, you have like 10 portals. Um, and basically, you know, it includes some health record data from the clinic like diagnostic test results, you know, but also things like electronic messaging, appointment scheduling, visit reviews, et cetera. And given the interest in patient engagement, you know, we really wanted to understand the perceived value of these personal health records, how they were being used, if this was a way that patients were engaging that just might not be apparent, right, to their, to their clinicians. And where could there be opportunities to advance these capabilities? And we found that teens got a bit more out of having an online personal health record. Uh, they were more likely to indicate that the information helped them ask questions that they would not have known to ask before, that after accessing the system, they knew more about their health, uh, and that they had an easier time keeping track of their information in the system. And from log data, we found that diagnostic test results um, 
were the most frequently accessed PHR feature. So I won't go into some of the other analyses, but I'm happy to, to follow up if people are interested in um, kind of what, what usage looked like over time for these families of this information. Anyway, one of the key things to, to point out here is um, that diagnostic test results were extremely popular. And this, is, this was a signal to us uh, for what we might, how we might um, go about the next phase of our research. So taken together, you know, we saw some key themes emerge from these studies. Both teens and parents had unmet information access and communication needs, um, often mentioning diagnostic data. Teens in particular wanted access to more diagnostic information. Some mentioned that their doctors perceived them as being unable to understand detailed explanations. And they wanted a lot more details than what they were getting. We heard things like, sometimes I tell my mom to ask questions uh, or questions to ask them so that I don't have to ask them. They don't want to explain everything to me because they think I won't get it. But if my mom asks a question, they'll go into full detail. And so we can already see here now that there's like a level of indirection um, and, uh, and potentially um, impediment to engagement. So our field work revealed that these patients spend a lot of time getting CT and MRI scans, you know, sometimes three or four per year. And this requires lots of preparation, waiting, getting scanned, and then not much reporting at the end. So the oncologist weighs in briefly, the patient's entitled to a copy on a DVD, radiology data though are really complex. So what do I do with this DVD, right? Um, this, these are comprised of thousands of cross-sectional slices of an anatomical region. I might forget what region they're scanning this time, right? Um, and a text report written by radiologists who are interpreting these images. And by default, they aren't designed around the needs of patients. They're much different, of course, from other diagnostic data like lab results, which have these well-defined straightforward measures and numerical ranges. So, we also observed that getting radiology reporting right for patients could have implications for things like explainability um, as automated analysis of imaging becomes much more common. So this is kind of one way in which we kind of did the research into a problem, um, did research that helped us, excuse me, uh, better understand kind of how to select the problem, right? Um, and through lots of, of context gathering, uh, uncovered a computing challenge that's both important to patients, but could also have wider implications for the, the field of computing. So entering phase three of this work, we honed in on the problem of helping families navigate these radiology reports. And we did three studies in this phase. So first we conducted an analysis of online health forum data to gauge patients' information needs related to imaging reports. Everything from length of questions and answers to stylistic considerations and how they ask questions, uh, how they explain things to one another. And then we ran some language modeling and text analytics on over 200,000 radiology reports and distilled phrases that provided a better understanding of the functions that these phrases serve in the report. And finally, we developed a web application with a touch-based user interface that was formatted for uh, a large tablet and it was designed to handle written content of a CT or MRI study, the, the actual report. And we ran a pilot study at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and we started with MRI and CT scans. So to build our corpus of questions about radiology reports, we scraped about 1600 posts using radiology specific keywords, um, and then ended up using about 480 question posts for analysis after excluding relevant content. So in our case, things like requests for social support, we did not uh, include <clears throat> or um, what, you know, uh, other questions surrounding the test. Um, so we did this qualitative analysis using techniques with human coders uh, and, and found that posters had questions at several levels. These are uh, the top level information needs listed in descending order of frequency. So first we have radiology report content itself, right? So what do terms and sections mean? What could be known from the specific diagnostic test? What does this general type of study show? Um, and where does it fit in with other testing? So number three, where does it fit in with, with other testing in the broader healthcare process? And finally, what role does this test play for my particular illness, right, or my particular complaint? 
And we found that posters largely went online to seek interpretation of report content. And importantly, not just terms. So further analysis of questions in this category revealed that there's a higher prevalence of questions regarding inferencing meaning from whole sections of the report and phrases, as opposed to medical terms alone. So this is starting to give us some insight into design goals for how an application might work that would support patients in reading their report, if we could better help them understand some of these things. So in the next study, in this research phase, we mined and sampled common phrases from a corpus of over 200,000 radiology reports, and we validated the concepts and um, functions of the language of these reports through individual sessions. And we included five attending uh, and two fellow radiologists. And you know, we did this because you know, why did we want to kind of look at the function that the language served? Why, why was it important to engage humans at this point? Why didn't we just sort of um, start throwing machine learning at it <laughs> and see like what came out? Um, well, let's take a quick look uh, at a sample radiology report. And don't worry about technical terms. We'll focus more on understanding general characteristics and key considerations for language processing. So first, you know, look at this section called indication on the top. So in this section, we have a sentence about findings. But because it's under indication, we know it's talking about previous findings motivating this current radiology study. So we need to know the structure and we need to know the structural features uh, in order to disambiguate that this, the findings spoken about here are not the findings of this report, but a previous report. So a naive algorithm just looking for declarative statements you know, could potentially get these findings wrong. And similarly, patients could be confused. All right, we also see varying resolution of temporal references. We can't plot all of the events that are referred to here. So if we think about making, opening this up and making it patient friendly, well, maybe we can help, um, you know, maybe we can help kind of orient the patient in terms of what was found when and uh, what is known, right? And maybe even organize this in a chronological um, representation. But, we can't plot all the events that are referred to. Sometimes they're really specific. Down here, we have yesterday at 5.30 p.m. You know, so that would help me uh, generate a more specific label you know, or help uh, in, a, in a UI that was, had a very specific date associated. But then we have terms like history of and calcification seen. And all we know is that the observations happened before the exam because that was they're motivating the need for the exam. So that's kind of helpful that this comes before, right, the, the, the current event, but it doesn't tell us much more than that. Well, then we have presence and absence of evidence, and this has varying specificity and at times really ambiguous qualifiers. So we have to be careful about conclusions. So in the second paragraph, we see mild asymmetry of the kidneys. How would we quantify mild asymmetry, right? We see terms like moderate amount of fluid. These are hard, right, to, to, uh, to represent in, in labels when there might be, you know, very different ways of using mild versus moderate across physicians, right? Some will be more conservative, some might not be in, in the use of these terms. Well, we also see that uncertainty is expressed in particular ways. So we see clinical correlation is recommended down here. Um, after mentioning the possibility of septic arthritis. So that means don't rely only on this exam <laughs> to make an arthritis diagnosis. But this is, this is kind of stated in a, in a fairly ambiguous way. And we see lots of references to body parts, but there's varying precision. So sometimes we're talking about kidneys, sometimes it's a specific region, left pelvis below ischial spine. Okay, that's fairly specific and I could potentially help a patient localize exactly where on the body that is. Um, but it would be difficult to account for the variance in precision if we were to, to just try to automatically link report fragments with locations, right, um, on the body, right, or try to, to localize them on a general um, physical model. So these functions and concepts are important and we wanted to distill a more complete set of phrases and their mappings to concepts and functions because you know, these are candidates for us to design for a patient-facing application. And so the seven radiologists we worked with used a study packet that asked them to review these phrases 
based on our extraction of common phrases from our report corpus um, and indicate matching concepts. And we paid attention to things like actions stated versus observations, uh, what are follow-up, how do people refer to follow-up um, recommendations versus um, specifying characteristics of what they're seeing, attributes of what they're observing. And this was all to get a sense of um, how to inform our design process. So at the end of these two studies, we found 13 concept categories that indicated important functions of the radiology report that can be supported through design. And I won't have time to go through the whole process, but we, we iterated on design ideas that embodied these concepts. Like, how can we better illustrate the size and appearance of a nodule found, right? If we, if we do have attributes, right, of, of something that's been observed like a nodule, how do we make that more understandable? How do we bring in graphical depictions when reference to a body part or organ is mentioned and we can localize it? So we selected a subset of concepts that our design could support, and then these informed our prototype. <clears throat> we, called the, we called the prototype rapport. Um, and for this phase, we decided to support some aspects of translation, just enough to scaffold you know, patients and their, and their parents' participation in clinical conversations about these reports. So you know, the, the original idea that I had was kind of uh, the, the computer science approach, right? Of like, oh, you know, these patients and their parents, they want more diagnostic information. Ooh, what if we trans, you know, they, 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 take, they have to like undergo these procedures and get these radiology studies. Whoa, wouldn't it be cool if we could just take a radiology report and translate it, right? Like that was kind of like the first thought. It was really important, you know, not to do that <laughs> as we saw from going through uh, the complexity of some of the language in, the, in those reports. So we developed a prototype called Rapport and I'll show you our design goals alongside the prototype we built next, but we use a suite of clinical text analysis tools to do some automated processing of an uploaded raw report in plain text. We used heuristic approaches to map sentences and noun phrases that we recognized um, with, with the CTAKE suite of libraries with API calls to libraries like Medline Plus for patient-friendly explanations. And, and we used uh, biodigital human anatomy, um, which, is, uh, which provides visual data. And these are rendered in our web application. And we can see here, um, you know, that, that we're moving along in our pipeline from having collected our data set and defining outcomes we care about, um, better understanding of diagnostic data, right, and support for clinical conversations, those being the objectives, to then doing, you know, the algorithmic development and system building for this goal and readying a prototype for evaluation. So this is, you know, this is gonna look like students built it <laughs> because, uh, because they did. And we wanted to stay in wireframe format from the beginning before focusing on visual design. So our first goal was to organize um, report content and make use of structural features to simplify navigation. And so, um, and so we, we kind of just restructured uh, content to pull some of the, the more actionable items right at the top. So impressions here are basically summarizing what the radiologist found. And typically they also include things like follow-up, which we can bring up you know, to make even more prominent so the patient knows what do I need to do, right? Which is one of the most pressing questions. <clears throat> uh, we also wanted to, <clears throat> yes, so, uh, so we, we kind of learned that these are kind of the, the most pressing information needs, made those more prominent. And then we wanted to clarify medical jargon within the clinical context to provide essentially lay-friendly explanations from trusted sources. So I'll show a video of this <clears throat> in action in a second. But of course, one thing that we've learned throughout our studies is that patients really also, and family members, right, caregivers, uh, informal and formal, need ways of contributing, right, when there's more to say. And so <clears throat> we also you know, include features to allow users to note questions for their oncologists, personal comments. And so here, <clears throat> Here, you know, we enable the user to compare reports, navigating to referenced exams from the current report to see the status um, and report summaries up front, as I, as I mentioned in, 
uh, the, the first view. We identify medical concepts and important sections of interest to really connect phrases and terms to auto link explanations that people can interact with further. So since we knew to look for things like size and position text, we were also able to add reference measures for sizing. And so here, you know, this is kind of just helping orient uh, the user, but you know, again, what does five millimeters mean? Well, it's easier to have a reference measure, right? So um, a familiar object, right? System suggestions are shown when ambiguous phrases are found in the report. So in this way, we're exploring some you know, mixed initiative interaction. And to support questions in the context of reading, um, you know, we wanted to be able to allow the patient to select or, or you know, user to select any portion of the report. Um, and they can browse, of course, the full report, uh, transparency being really important in this context, uh, but, but also uh, you know, the goal was to maintain context, right? <clears throat> so con content from the, the cards that you saw is automatically made available to add to a user's notes if needed. Okay, so we ran a pilot with patients, parents, and oncologists at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Um, and, you know, this was basically us bringing in technology um, uh, into, into the exam room. Uh, we acquired the most recent patient CT or MRI scan report. And in most cases, the scan was conducted that day on site uh, and the report was completed the same day. And so we were able to promptly review it with the oncologist, right? These, these studies really also uh, require a lot of clinical collaboration. So we wouldn't wanna show a patient or their family member a report the oncologist hasn't kind of vetted yet. Um, and that's one of the interesting challenges I think for people who work in this space is like, how much automation needs oversight and how much can, can be done um, and, and that we can sort of, sort of make assumptions about um, the fact that it, it would be benign, right? What's benign and what's potentially not benign. So after oncologist review, we uploaded uh, the report into the prototype and a researcher demonstrated the features of this prototype performing kind of a guided tutorial using a sample. So after the tutorial, uh, the, the, the families could decide you know, if they wanna see their report. And so we loaded the patient data and they were able to interact with the device unguided. And for us, it was really important to observe, right? Um, and kind of be descriptive at this phase. <clears throat> so we included a total of 28 patients and family participants and five oncologists. And we wanted to, again, situate kind of the initial review within the clinical setting. Okay, so what do we find? Well, in the clinic, we found the interaction with the report led to really dynamic interspersing of report interaction and, and patient and clinician-led discussions. So these, these discussions sometimes started out focusing on technical concepts uh, because for a lot of patients, they were seeing these for the first time, but they, they wanted to know, right? They wanted to kind of look them up and, and dig into the data. And patients and parents then drew on this technical knowledge fairly quickly. Um, to ask about symptoms, disease, process, and treatment. And so this was really cool uh, because we weren't necessarily expecting that. You know, give the family a tablet, is that gonna come between them and the oncologist, right? Is throwing a bunch of technical <laughs> information at them, does that, you know, is that going to help them understand their, their disease process, right, and their treatment? And in fact, it kind of gave the confidence uh, to, to ask questions about what they were seeing and connect that to their experience. And so this was cool. And so when, at, when answering questions, we saw that clinicians demonstrated visuospatial concepts by alternating between sketching and physically referencing areas of the patient's bodies. So they were interacting more and, and through more gestures with the patient and, and just kind of richer interaction. Uh, and to the point where they were sketching things out on drawing boards and bed sheets. And so, you know, several patients and parents told us that, that they appreciated it and, and that they really liked that they didn't need to kind of filter the quality of the search, right? That, that this was information that was vetted, but also kind of um, uh, in ways that met their needs. And so, so the, basically the co-located um, simultaneous interaction with the report led to, you know, what we would consider to be really positive clinician-patient communication and really did, uh, you know, 
uh, suggest a lot more engagement than what we were seeing before we introduced this technology. So you know, we've done a bunch of design iterations on this uh, to kind of improve the UI, but we're excited about the new avenue for teenage patient engagement. Um, uh, and, you know, again, like we probably wouldn't have thought of this if we were just like, oh, teens, huh, they're having a hard time engaging. Maybe we should create a video game, right? And maybe that's a good idea, right? For certain, for certain um, scenarios. But in this case, right, it was actually something that we would not never have uh, arrived at on our own had we not really involved families in the process. And so this laid a bunch of foundations. We've since done work in the adolescent data privacy space. Um, uh, which has led to privacy work groups and adoption of policy recommendations at healthcare centers. <clears throat> so let's see. I'm just I'm just aware of time here. So um, you know, we our subsequent work has also looked at things like the difficulties that families faced understanding and communicating about health experiences between visits, right? So we don't just want to help during those clinical visits, because we know that a lot of health management takes place, you know, actually between, right? This is where people are experiencing symptoms, illness experiences, um, and where the support of the family, right, is really so important. And so fortunately, researchers have created a framework for capturing what are called observations of daily living. And so to summarize these, physical symptoms, mood, et cetera, describe status indicators, Activities and behavioral indicators and social and environmental contexts are exposures, <clears throat> or sorry, activities are behavioral indicators, right? Where the environmental context and social, social context are exposures. And so we know, you know, what general types of observations matter. And so again, this is where we also made sure we took participatory approaches to defining how to elicit these observations. Um, through a process that's actually, you know, more meaningful for patients and family members. So in co-design sessions uh, with the same patient population, teens, you know, provided kind of a narrative to us. So they placed these ODL cards that we created that you can kind of see in the photo here. And these are very, this is at the level of very sketchy, right? Like this is like really simple drawings. Um, but it helped us in communicating and you know, in participating in these design activities uh, just to get something on paper. <clears throat> and so our goal was to have them kind of lead the narrative and provide a storyboard to place uh, these cards in order in an order that was meaningful for them to tell us about their illness experiences. <clears throat> and we use these representations to create design instruments um, to accompany the teen in their everyday in their everyday life. And you know, figuring out how they want to express illness experiences and observations is important because clinical instruments for asking about how they're feeling and how they're doing with care instructions didn't match how these patients thought about their experiences. So, and there was a mismatch, like if you're doing a review of systems, right? And you're asking, you're prompting the team to kind of tell you how they're doing. You know, we found that like you ask a you ask a patient how their pain level is, it's fine, it's okay, right? You ask them, well, are you playing basketball lately? Oh no, you know, oh really? Well, tell tell me more about that, right? Like, well, it hurts to hold the ball a certain way, or I can't run like I used to, right? It, we really we really found that um, the way these instruments are set up doesn't really elicit uh, the the experience in the way that teens would like to talk about them. And so here's a close-up of some of the cards we used and generated together with patients and, and, uh, and their families. We had individual and group sessions because we you know, obviously want to get uh, the teens lived experience with that. You know, there's a lot that goes into planning these, these co-design sessions. Like sometimes we use dyads so that we're balancing researcher uh, and co-designer dynamics, right? We have to be careful about like, you don't want to have three researchers and then the kid like, okay, I better make a good storyboard, right? Uh, so, so we want to be very, you know, uh, mindful of some of the power dynamics when when we come in with our, you know, with our research forms and um, and our activities. So, you know, we did a number of different types of approaches, but <clears throat> certainly one researcher with a dyad of uh, patients who are going through the same condition it was one of the approaches. Uh, and then having, giving patients opportunities to 
work with their peer versus work with the family was another one, you know, where we were able to explore certain um, different scenarios in different contexts. <clears throat> and so, you know, this was really about scaffolding some storytelling through visual artifacts, right? And encouraging recognition over recall of observations. And so, you know, it also helped us kind of understand where there might be conflicting interpretations. And we found that it was really important um, for any, any uh, design of an experience for the family to elicit this data to really have multiple options for contributing. So in other words, we don't just wanna have kind of one user uh, using a, an experience that uh, contributes experiences of the patient, right? We want to actually have multiple inputs and multiple perspectives uh, so that we can enable the, the care team as a whole to resolve these together. So anyway, we, we found that this helped us resolve some discrepant team uh, and parent reports about the patient's health status um, and balance some asymmetries in power. And we followed this up with the diary study um, to look at collaborative aspects of logging experiences. We included more patient um, conditions in this, in this study. So we have rheumatology, oncology, and hematology. And we provided diaries for families to use to log their experiences and do some freeform sketching. So there was some generative input too. And this was really important because we found that particularly for things like, like emotion logging, um, teens wanted like, to have expressive capabilities. So they didn't wanna just sort of tell you where they were on a scale, right? It was actually really important for them to take photos of what their emotion is, right? Or draw. Um, and so this kind of generative creative input ends up being really important. What we do with that is an open question, right? Like this doesn't match necessarily like the, the, the types of scales that we're used to clinically. So I think there's some really exciting work to do there to help with some of the translation um, of, of this kind of generative input, right? And how we actually make clinical assessments based on that. So that was work um, that was, uh, that was uh, that work that was, uh, I almost said presented, but it wasn't because Kai was canceled, um, but, uh, but we have that paper. And, you know, this really informed, this co-design study and this diary study really informed a mobile health application um, that we tested out with a small number of families um, so that the technology itself will serve as a design instrument and help us better understand how these different stakeholders really want to report on and, and capture right, their daily lived experiences. And so, you know, this is, this is in progress, of course, but again, the idea is like, how do we take the idea of observations of daily living and, um, and really, um, make them a lot richer and um, kind of and, and allow them to sort of match how the patient would like to express these observations. <clears throat> and then how do we kind of bring the whole family in uh, so that, you know, the lived experience of the patient is represented, but we're not burdening them entirely, right? We don't want to tell a patient who's going through, you know, potentially really difficult treatment, hey, you know, do more work, use this application, right? So this is a real tension. Okay, so this is work in progress. Um, and since I'm close to time here, I wanna make sure we have time for questions. How are we doing? Uh, we have, yeah, we, have a, we, have, we still have time for questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Okay. So I'll basically kind of list what I think are really important <laughs> things to work on in this space. Uh, and, and some of them, you know, relate to some of the projects I talked about. Some of them are, uh, you know, much more nation. So user trust in the age of personalized medicine. Um, you know, we're moving toward this vision, right? The National Academy of Engineering has set this grand challenge for the 21st century of like, you know, personalized medicine and these integrated interconnected networks of nanoscale data, internet of things data, your health records, right? Well, <clears throat> obviously, you know, this raises tons of questions about how do we do this responsibly? Um, how do we design for ecosystems, not functions, but do this in a way that's human centered so that people don't feel like they're serving the applications, right? That they're serving the systems, but that these are actually designed 
in ways that preserve privacy um, and <clears throat> put, the, put the family and the community at the center. Um, you know, we're also seeing, of course, as we move to more and more AI being embedded, consent becomes really important. And, you know, this is also tied up with locus of control and the decision action cycle. So, you know, if I wanted to get a recommendation for something that could help with my symptoms, let's say I'm logging my symptoms. Well, you know, if, if an assistant is gonna be helping to retrieve some possible recommendations, that retrieval is another, is an action that generates yet more data. What is, what is the right, you know, model for engaging in consent, in, in consent processes um, as AI does more and more on the patient's behalf. And so I think this is a really understudied consent and AI is a really understudied topic that I'm, that I'm very interested in. And then, you know, AI is a member of the care team. So decision-making, patient clinician decision-making relies on social relationships based on trust. And there's legal, there's a legal framework of professional advice giving right now that, that governs that. So given that there are knowledge asymmetries between doctors and patients already, and now we're gonna have knowledge asymmetries you know, between AI systems and doctors and patients, right? And so how do we ensure that autonomy is protected once AI is introduced as a member of the care team and offering recommendations? So, you know, in order to make informed choices, the patient or, or, and their family, right, with whom the decision ultimately rests, has to be aware of the range of options. And so, you know, how do we think about introducing in more and more intelligence, auto, you know, automation and, and AI into these collaborative care contexts? Um, and, you know, there's, there's an interesting study, a case study that we're publishing at CHI this year um, that that focuses on this in a different context, it's pathologists interacting for the first time with an AI assistant. And we found that the local like case specific reasoning or model output decision making wasn't as much of interest to these pathologists. So typical ways we think about interpretability and transparency like really weren't what these pathologists wanted. They wanted upfront information about basic global properties of the model like strengths and limitations, um, its subjective point of view, if it's more or less conservative, what's designed to be optimized for, to run independently versus compensate for human, for human bias, right? So, you know, how do we enable transparency uh, in these upfront introductions? How do we think, and, you know, I don't know if onboarding is quite the right term. It's the term that we've used um, in our work, but, you know, as we evolve our understanding, you know, how do we kind of think about mental models that are being brought into these interactions and what's the best way, right, of reconciling these mental models so that um, people are using these in the ways intended and not over relying, for example, on these AI systems. Um, okay, thanks so much for your attention. I'm, this is, I'm at the end and, and thank you. Uh, I wanna acknowledge um, uh, some of our funders and have time to take questions. Thanks, Lauren. So we, we have a good amount of time for questions. Feel free to either raise your hand if you're on the panelist side of things or post your questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, yeah, however, however you wanna enter questions. Uh, just a uh, thank you from Gina Hayu uh, for for such a, a, a great talk. Yeah, oh, hey Gina, <laughs> it's really hard not to be able to hang out with you all, like to just grab coffee and yeah. So I look forward to doing that with with you all and, and with Gina when we're on the other side, which hopefully will be soon. Go ahead, Mayara.
Okay, hi. Thanks for your talk, Lauren. It was great. Um, I was just uh, very curious about the, there was a moment that you mentioned it, that uh, the, the children, teenagers, they had, they wanted to describe their experiences in a different way, right? Not only using, I don't know, a Likert scale or a form or anything like that. They wanted to have pictures and things like that. And you briefly mentioned that uh, providers not necessarily knew what to do with it, if I understood correctly, or had a use for it. And so in my research, I found something similar in relation to fertility data in which individuals had all this, uh, they collected all this amount of data and they used that. And that was useful for them for like make them feel a sense of control that they had um, to help them uh, going through that hard experience. But on the other side, the physicians didn't use that, didn't need that. And then did they, they wanted just like only very specific types of data from their um, physician, from, from their patients. So in our study, we end up with the conclusion that it was not um, in that specific case, we should not aim to like merge those two data practices as we talked, and we should keep them different because they, um, they serve different purposes. So I was just wondering if that was something that you saw something similar to that, or if that uh, those findings that you mentioned it point to that direction to the, and how, how do you envision that happening in that uh, context? Yeah, so I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think this is really difficult, but yet, you know, something that we need to spend more effort and understanding. And so I, I'm very interested in, in the work that you're referring to and I'd love to read it. So please, first, please send it my way. Um, so, so I, I, I want to comment on something you said, which is, you know, keeping, like keeping some of this data, we, we don't want to merge it, right? And I, and I, and I get that it's, it's not, we, we would not want to misinterpret, you know, something that is creatively generated um, and give, try, you know, try to, try to quantify something that, that is actually kind of not non-quantifiable, right? So that, so I, I think that we can establish as like, do not quantify things that are not, you know, generated uh, through a quantitative um, intent. Um, one thing though, that I've also observed in other studies is that <clears throat> some, there, there's kind of a need for reflection often before being able to accurately answer questions that do get at more quantifiable information, right? Like where someone is on a scale. And so in similar stuff, you know, not, not quite similar, but in, I would say adjacent, but still relevant studies where, you know, we're launching things like ecological momentary assessment and people are logging, you know, how they're feeling. Um, you know, one, one question I have is, you know, would some reflective, would a reflective experience where they can reflect on um, other types of data they've collected, other ways that they've expressed how they were doing that day or feeling, would that actually help answer you know, the quantitative prompt? Um, so it's an open question that I have, but, but what we found in some of those you know, adjacent but relevant studies is that you know, people kind of give answers and sometimes they're satisficing. Like sometimes they're like, well, I don't know. I don't have really, I don't really have time. Um, or again, like, hmm, how, what's my pain level? I'm in the middle, you know, because they, they, they think they're, they think that's neutral, right? They think that that's, um, that causes the, the least harm in a situation in which they don't really feel prepared to answer, um, but they also know that an answer is expected and they don't want to, they don't want to create harm by um, being too polar, right, um, on, on, on either end. And so, I, you know, I wonder if there's an opportunity here to think about to think about you know reflective experiences and the relationship between being able to reflect and being able to answer um, some of these questions that are posed through you know or, or that, are, that are essentially delivered through instruments that require um, that someone choose a point on the scale, for example. That's great. Thank you. Other questions. Uh, I'll ask one while we're waiting for other other questions to come in. Um, 
So, so one of the things that you brought up is kind of uh, bringing the human centered design process into kind of all, all stages of the designs of AI technologies. Um, and, I, and I think in a large part, like a, a lot of us on this call really agree to that sentiment, right? Like that's, that's something that, that, that we all kind of buy into as, as uh, informatics or human centered design researchers. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, particularly since you've had the opportunity to work with a lot of the people who are designing these AI systems firsthand, like how do we, how do we bridge that gap? How do we, like, how do we demonstrate our value? <laughs> to those yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I will say that I think that's starting to happen. Like, um, the understanding that model accuracy alone is not enough, right, when we actually deploy technology, that's big. Like that, that actually, I think, made a huge, um, kind of what's the right way to phrase this? Like, I think there was not an understanding. So I think some of this, this is multifactorial. So I think, I think some of this is about having the right research happening when some of these things are, are deployed and doing that in these perspective studies. So I think like the perspective study model is really good for like, oops, you know, like we didn't think about this and quite enough upfront, right? Or, or maybe we didn't, maybe we thought we did, right? We don't know. And, you know, so how do we, how do we do have the right engagement um, in deployment to, to be able to do this safely and feed results back so that we can improve our systems? And so, so that is something that we were able to do. Um, for example, in the diabetic retinopathy work and in some of the um, human AI onboarding work for pathologists that Carrie Kai led, there was definitely like feedback, right? That went into the model, um, uh, the further model development, kind of the iterative model development and then system development to be able to surface information generated from the model. Um, so I think part of it is just safe protocols, perspective approaches where we, we can actually, you know, still learn and have um, that opportunity. And then I think absolutely like, you know, kind of the big question is like, how do we move upstream a bit more? And I think, you know, I don't know the answer. <laughs> so I'm not gonna pretend that, that I know the answer, um, but I, I do think a lot of people are interested in this and that there, there's enough attention being paid right now um, that, um, that, that we, hopefully we'll, we'll make strides, right? That, that will have kind of lasting impact. Uh, there is more recognition that, that these more upstream approaches are needed. And it's really interesting to see fields like human computer interaction and CSCW start to have you know, more overlap with, with um, communities like FACT um, and the AI you know, machine learning community. So like there's, there's observations that there's a little bit of reinventing of the wheel happening you know, on kind of the machine learning and um, fairness, accountability, and transparency community. So, you know, now that that's observed, you know, we're, I, I think we're starting to come together as fields. And so, but there's a lot of structural stuff, right, that we have, I mean, it's like, I wouldn't even begin to, <laughs> you know, but we could, you know, there's, there's, a, there's so much to do. And, and, and some of it is, I think, related to silos in academia, right, that we have, you know, there's pressures of, of the, the tenure track system, there's pressures of, funding, um, uh, not pressure, constraints, right? There's, there's constraints imposed, right? By certain funding models, um, by the way departments are structured. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think, you know, finding ways of collaborating and, and then thinking about how we can incentivize that, right? Through funding programs, for example, that incentivize that would be one example, right? But I think these are also, you know, just big structural challenges that we are definitely working toward, um, but that will take some time to improve. Yeah, definitely hard to, to address those structural ones. Um, well, we'll take one last question from, from Gina. She's asking how much prevalence do you think AI is integrated or how much do you think that AI technology is integrated into the clinical industry? I'm sure there's a, a wide range of level of complexities, but what's the simplest form of integration and how prevalent is that? Clinical decision support, fairly prevalent. Um, deep learning based AI, not as prevalent. So um, some of the imaging, you know, binary classification tasks, uh, 
performed on uh, for diagnostic imaging much further along. Um, and we have FDA approval, for example, in, in the US for those kinds of technologies. But other others are gonna be, I think, uh, not common practice for a while. All right, then with that, let's let's thank Lauren one more time. <laughs> and and that wraps up our seminar for winter quarter. So thank you all. <laughs>